Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Real quick, before I get into this video, I want to tell you about PopCultureZone.com. They are a website specializing in comic books, some of the hottest variants, and CGC comics. You can get raw comics. They specialize in lots of 10. And for those raw comics, if you are shipping to the domestic United States, you only pay $4.99 flat rate shipping. PopCultureZone.com. Now on to the video. You really want to know who Superman is? <laughs> Watch this. Oh! We are back again with another episode of that Simple Man's Comics and Friends podcast. Another super, super great guest tonight. You guys might know him as Peter Santa Maria, or you most likely know him as Attack Peter. How's it going, buddy? What's up, Brian? Thank you for having me, brother. Appreciate it, man. I love watching your show. It's great stuff. Yeah, I jumped at the chance when when there was the opportunity presented itself to have you on this show. I said, absolutely. So glad that you are here tonight. We're going to get into some great stuff. Now, real quick for my viewers on this channel that might not know too much about you, which I'm sure after this episode, they, they will. But for now, can you let the community know a little bit more about yourself, where you came from, how, you know, kind of from not, I won't say from birth, but <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Like, well, there's a birth canal. <laughs> yeah. That's where my mind went immediately. Uh, I'm a, the humor, since the humor of a 10 year old. I'm, so, I'm the same way. Someone okay, says that perfect. to me. I'm like, well, it started in a yeah. rainy night in 76, <laughs> but exactly. But yeah. Just kind of let the viewers know, Hey yeah, man, what you're all about. Yeah. So uh, again, yeah, I'm Peter Santa Maria. I, uh, I started a, well, I, I started an Instagram handle called attack Peter some years ago and it stuck. And now it's the name of this uh, company that I help to manage and run and work on at skybound uh, entertainment. And um, for, I'm sure a lot of you guys know, watching, you know, skybound entertainment, skybound comics, image comics, that whole uh, team over there makes just the most kick-ass stuff. And they've been making it for such a long time that uh, uh it, it, I really get to live my dream every day. I'm an artist. I work primarily in printmaking, which is, uh, um, I guess, an un unusual medium for some people. It, it, it deals with me carving images out of linoleum, rolling ink on the carvings, pressing paper onto them, and then making prints that way. And uh, because it's an unusual medium in our world of like pop culture, comics, uh, movie posters, it, it really caught on. Um, you know, in the last five years, especially, and uh, got the attention of the folks at Skybound. And now we're working together on building this uh, brand. And most excitingly for me uh, recently is getting into making artwork uh, in comics. So I always say like, like I snuck into comics or they snuck me in the back door at comics because I used to always think that, you know, this art style may or may not go over well with uh, traditional comics fans, but I am so pleased to find out that that's quite the opposite. And like, yeah, there's the the variant cover I did for Ultra Mega. Shout out uh, everyone at Skybound, James Heron for you know tolerating my artwork, <laughs> and uh, you know Big Clutch Sean Kirkham over there, and and the whole team at Skybound making it happen. Uh, it, it's it's amazing. I get I live my dream every day, Brian, as we'll talk about, I'm sure. But um, again, just happy to to step in and tiptoe into this world. A little bit yeah, here. I want to bring up, I mean, you you mentioned unusual, yeah. right? An unusual form of art. I almost would say that it's almost a lost form of art also because in today's time, you know, there's a lot more digital type artwork. So the, the process that you go through and for those that aren't aware, make sure you guys check out Attack Peter on Instagram. Make sure you check out, he also has a great YouTube channel that he goes through the process and breaks it down. And it's, it's just... It's almost mesmerizing to watch where you say, hey, here's my piece of linoleum. And then it's like, I'm going to sketch it out real quick. And I was like, what's he sketching out? It just looks like black blobs. It's a and mess. Turn it into this amazing piece of art that you could do prints on. Yeah, you know, it's it's it. You're, you're right. It's it's an it's one of the oldest forms of art. It's, it's, the, it's like one of the original ways of making multiples. So like when we, you know, buy. Uh, prints of our favorite artists and their artwork or get posters you know if you collect m posters from like mondo or um their beautiful screen prints or you know lith you know not lithographs but their digital prints and like you said that while there was a handmade process in the uh in the steps of making the artwork at some point it, it goes through this like machine uh, made process and so these prints that i make these posters that i make the artwork i make the whole thing is handmade from start to finish and, and uh as you're saying yeah like the drawings start off 
real terribly. And uh, it's, it's one of the greatest things about the relationships I've formed is the people that we work with learn that my sketches are not indicative of the final product, but it's just the way I, I get things on uh, the linoleum. And yeah, you, you literally get uh, gouges and blades and you carve out the negative space or the background of the image so that what's left is like a raised area, like a stamp. Like if you, when you got stamps and you're a little kid, you know, you did well, it's like the same thing when you see a stamp, but larger. And that allows me to make multiples over and over again, uh, depending on our edition size, of course, and uh, get everybody a handmade piece of artwork, uh, oftentimes for less than you would even get, you know, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the price of these things for less than you would get sometimes a screen print or a digital print or a lithograph. And, and I'm, and I'm real proud of that or Jaclay, you know, and I'm real proud of that because um, I always felt that I wanted to have an inclusive um, presence in this, in the art world that, you know, I grew up in, didn't go to a lot of art schools or didn't take a lot of art classes as a kid, but in college I took real like conceptual art classes. So the kind of stuff that you see joked about, you ever see the movie uh, Art School Confidential, for example? It's exactly like that. It sometimes it feels like the worse you draw, the better they love it, and everything felt very exclusive. It's like the banana that... taped on the wall. Yes, yeah, yes. That's really a thing that you have to contend with. And I'm from Miami, so that's the hometown of that nonsense. And uh, the idea is that I always thought about like I want to make artwork that my buddies would enjoy and be impressed with, but I also wanted to make artwork that my grandpa, my uncles and aunts, like could at least get it. You know what I mean? And not when we used to have like gallery exhibitions when I was in college, I remember them showing up. And sometimes I felt like they felt bad that they didn't understand what they were looking at. They may or may not have, but I felt that sometimes they felt like outsiders or oddballs. And so I hated that. I hated that they would feel that. I respect everybody's right to make whatever they want, but I wanted to make stuff where you get it. And if you loved it, you can get the handmade one and you know, you don't have to be a millionaire to pick it up. One of, one of the things I like is, I mean, it, it stays with what we've been saying about sure. it's unusual, but you almost have seemed to have no pun intended, but carved yourself your own little niche, you know, that kind of stands out, sticks out. And it's one of those things where if you see it, you know, you know that that's your type of art style. That's your, hey, I think that's an attack, Peter. You can just look at it and kind of automatically know what it is. If you see, you know, comic book artists that are like that with, yep. with painting, but the way you do it with your screen prints, how- Block prints. Block prints, sorry. No, no, it, it's, it's good because most of them are, most of the time you do get screen prints. Yeah. And that artwork sometimes it is. And so the difference, just so you know, like it's, it's close and, and we have made screen prints so that you know. But like screen print, so what the difference is, is folks will have, or whoever's making the screen print, it's a screen that has a certain amount of the holes plugged up and some of them open. And then you drag ink through the screen and the right amount of ink goes through, makes your image. You do it in layers and you get a multicolored screen print. Yeah, I've always wondered what, how, I mean, it kind of makes Crazy. sense when you watch them drag it, but it's always yeah. like, well, how do they block it? Yeah, it's a, it's a chemical and then like, it's almost like old school photography where you burn an image with a chemical into the screen and then the chemical that you use to, or the, the liquid that you use to block the holes, it only is a, this is like a, a real layman way of explaining. I'm not that smart about it, but uh, the, the, that chemical only blocks certain holes that have been burned with the image. So gotcha. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, it's the, the point is that you're not wrong. And that is something that I thought about since day one, dude, one of my, if not my favorite artist of all time, the artist whose artwork got me to stop everything I was doing in my life. Cause I was trying to be a musician in my early teens, early twenties. And uh, then I walked into a comic book store in Orlando. Uh, it was called Coliseum of comics. And I was actually there to meet uh, Jim Lee. He was doing an autograph signing and uh, for, during the hush days and all that. And uh, I saw a t-shirt on the wall hanging of Mike Mignola's Hellboy. And dude, it, I never seen Hellboy. I didn't know it changed everything. I'm like, what is this? And it sent me down a spiral that to this day, I see that stuff and I go, there's something rare here and unusual. And it attracts, it, it pulled me off my career path. Like it pulled me 
off what I thought I was going to do with my life and into just wanting to tap into that to some degree. And it was something that I worked on forever. Like you're saying, I want you to see my artwork, Brian, and know it's me. I want you to know it's my work from a distance, you know, partially part of the reason why I always made larger 20 by 30 size images is to be at a convention floor when there's so many awesome artists, I always displayed my stuff vertically, the biggest size I can make it so that if you were like four booths away, I wanted you to accidentally look up and go, wait, what's that? And then feel like you have to come over. So yeah, all of that is something that I thought about. And, you know, to go back to what we said before, even though it's an, um, an older style and a more and a less common style, there are a lot of awesome printmakers out there today making kick-ass stuff. It's just that they don't usually um, show up in this world. You don't usually see them right. at a comic con or, and you know what I'm saying? So, um, or I just, stumble, like you mentioned, I stumble upon stuff like that through like Mondo or those right. Mondo drops and, yeah. or um, bottleneck galleries. Another yeah, one. Yeah. BNG is great. And then the only, the only part that I caught on when you were talking about it being um, raised is it took me back to like fifth grade art and, and the word bar relief came in. Came into it's the same. <laughs> it's, it's, it's dude. It's funny. Cause that's where I usually taught. Cause I was a teacher, an art teacher for years. And that's when you start teaching kids. Printmaking is, is in elementary school, like fifth grade, sixth grade. Um, and yeah, you do use that term bar relief because you create a recessed area and a raised area. So it's exactly that. And Frankly, people who end up like if, if somebody were to collect the original carving and frame that, you know, it is sculptural. It's 3D at that point. And so, yeah, we used to explain that to kids at that age so they understand the importance of having that raised area and what we call it. So, yeah, you're right on the money, man. So how long does it take you from, hey, um, bare piece of linoleum to like your finished blocked out right before you start, you know, putting the ink on it and making the prints? Um, it depends on how, what, what really I spend the most of my time on is the composition. And so like, literally I do these sketches digitally, like on, on my iPad procreate and, um, they're just, they look just as bad. The sketch is there. I'll send you some, so you can show off. They're real, real bad. And, uh, but the important part of those sketches is to know where things are going to be, because as you can imagine, there's no erasing in this. Uh, medium once you cut into it it's there so you really have to know <laughs> pasting what, stuff back on yeah yeah or you know what happens is i do make mistakes and then i just try to rework the design on the fly which is stressful and uh, i'm sure i have at least a few ulcers because of it but the point is that uh yeah i spend the most of my time on the layout and for me the why that's so important is i know this artwork for the most part is big large size artwork now you add a frame you're really taking up a lot of space and if someone was, you know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, interested in buying one of these pieces, I imagine that they don't live in a mansion. They have a regular size home or a small home. And this thing has to probably be their single representation of that character or that property or that thing. So I want it to be like, sometimes I feel like I want to play with compositions and make something that like, I don't know, like you're the you're looking at the guy all the way in the back at the cantina scene and all that. But I never want to do that because I want to give everybody the biggest like splash page vibe, you know, an iconic splash page vibe. So I've got to nail that composition, you know, in case it's the only representation they have. So to answer that question, that's where I spend the most of the time. But once I get the thing sketched on, I sketch it in a matter of seconds. Like it's a literally a big fat Sharpie. I only draw with that. And then I'll usually draw with a white marker or a white color pencil, some details in, and I start carving and so something that's 18 by 24 in size, which is the big size I work in. It can be between three, five days, uh, eight hour days usually. And uh, sometimes I'll go a little longer. And in the, if I'm feeling it, do a 12 hour day, you know, it's not uncommon over here. And uh, yeah, but it, it, it depends on the image, but that's roughly, I would say, I usually block out a week worth of days to carve it out. Do you, do you have to go to like a, an art store to get that? Or can you go to Lowe's and get linoleum? No, not the same. Yeah. Yeah. It, you're, and that's where I first heard the term too, is linoleum tile. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are similarities, obviously it is material is the same, but it's different in it's in this presentation, but yeah, you can get it even on Amazon prime uh, or Amazon. I should say uh, uh, linoleum. It's, it's, 
it, it comes in different sizes and there's some that's softer, some that's harder. And when we give it to kids or a beginner, really, because it is, you know, you're dealing with a sharp tool. You need to learn the feel of your hand or else you're going to cut. There's always bleeders in the class. You know what I mean? And so there's uh, softer ones, there's harder ones, but the company I have to shout out who always takes care of us and they make some of the best stuff is Speedball, the same company that used to make a lot or that makes a lot of that black ink that, you know, inkers would use forever. Um, so yeah, Speedball hooks us up with the linoleum and ink and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and that, that's the stuff that you can get on any art store, any art website, and of course, Amazon. Yeah, and it's great because I, I watch it and between you and some of these other great artists, right? That always like talking about where you use the big black sharpie, right? And, yeah. And it's and you watch it and you get you make it you make it look so easy, but I know it's not. And it's funny because it's something that back in the day I'd be like like Bob Ross or whatever, yeah. got the pretty little trees, everything like turning. I don't want to say blob. I'm not meaning it in a bad way. No, but I hey, get you. you take it a black a blob. blob and you turn it into this amazing piece of art. And you're like, you try to do it yourself and it just looks like a messy black blob. Well, you know what? It, the best I can, way I can explain, because the funny thing is, again, you know, as somebody who taught for so long, you have to be careful sometimes when you're doing something proficiently and efficiently because you create a false sense of expectation in, in the minds of a young student. And they just say, okay, well, I guess it's easy or it looks easy or the best way to do it is fast and crazy and all this. Right. And what's important is to, is to let people know that this is not easy. Even now for me, the challenges really are in the expectations I put on myself and what I, and do I nail it? You know, am I nailing it? But in terms of the making of the work itself, the, the fact of the matter is you do something long enough. I have piles of work that I consider like not too great and it doesn't ever show up. You know, I don't put it out. I, 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 I actually, sometimes I do show like I, I did a Godzilla piece for Mondo and I, uh, and I started, I got halfway through it and I go, there's, there's something really off here. And I just stopped, jumped, but I never tossed it. And I, and I showed it on one of my streams so people can see like what I'm thinking about, you know, uh, why this is not successful or why this was worth bailing on, why it wasn't salvageable. And, but, you know, like we were talking before the stream, like, like we were both saying that, uh, that you learn streaming, like, and production, video production, dude, the best thing about that. And I was telling you that a year ago, my wife and I, who do the streams on YouTube, we didn't know anything about this stuff, dude. And, um, it was this amazing opportunity to feel like a noob again, which I, I love it because it means growth is coming. And, and the older you get, the more, you know, you get set in your you know areas of expertise. You don't feel like that very often and, and you miss it. I miss it. I love to be the least experienced and the, the least and, and the most ignorant person when it comes to a new skill. And I know that there's people around who can help me get better. That's an amazing feeling. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I, I enjoy that, too. And yeah. I think sometimes the most fun, I don't want to say funner, the most funnerest is is the journey from yeah. trying to, you know, OK, start from somewhere and then watching yourself grow. And I mean, I, I've had a channel for four years now and there's still like so much, so much growth that I, I need to do. But I enjoy how far I've come and and just like you said, doing every craft is different and watching your process and, and watching you work out. Now, when you do, you're talking about being at conventions and things like that. Do you um, just bring your prints there? Or do you sometimes do like working on prints while you're at the convention or is it kind of a mi mixed bag of both or? Well, yeah, uh, you know, everything, frankly, because like I said, this was, um, a path without really a template in front of me, you know, um, I, I fantasized and always dreamed of being able to be like my favorite comic artist that they show up to a nice clean table. They have a stack of prints, a stack of books, maybe like a binder with some original art, a nice white piece of Bristol, a pencil, maybe a brush with some ink and that's it. And you know what I'm saying? But that's not what I do, you know, and so I have to really explain this. So I had to, I would be remiss if I didn't bring a carved piece of linoleum, 
an uncarved piece of linoleum, an example of every tool that I used, um, a video either on an iPad or my phone that either myself or my wife, Gabby, could pop out and go, look. And all of that together, I think, you know, where it started off as me just wanting to make sure I'm communicating this properly, ended up creating an experience for folks and where you don't just feel like you're there to buy something like a customer and, you know, in, in a shop, you feel like you got some insight into another world because what, what we do, you know, yourself included, like a lot of people don't even understand how to turn the camera on, you know, people don't understand how to stream something, how to make uh, artwork that looks a certain way. So whenever we share that with someone, we're really giving them a, a, a special experience. And then the artwork, the print, you know, the sale, that's almost like an artifact of the experience, like a souvenir. Like that was an amazing time. And I love this artwork and owning this artwork is going to be extra special now because it reminds me of all that. So yeah, it's important to me to convey that. Yeah, I think that's great because I know like a lot of people might just be walking on seeing a print and they don't know the level of effort that goes yeah. into it. But you having all that and then, like you said, having the videos, it is great because just as you said, you see the print, but then you experience the experience, so to say, yeah. of, wow, that's what goes into that. And, and I, I could see people like, I had no idea I'm buying a print just because of uh, just seeing how that process works out. And, and I've been showing, as you've been talking about your, your process, you know, we've been showing your, your ghost of Tsushima video. So the viewers can see what oh, I was cool. going into it as well. And I had one question because you made that video. It was about a year ago before that video game came out. Oh yeah. Did you get a chance to play it? Oh, I love it, dude. I love it. I, and I just heard all the, uh, the news of the director's cut or whatever the, the expansion coming out. I'm ready to do it again. I love it. I'm a big video game fan nerd. And I'm always thinking about how can just like, I feel like I snuck into comics with these uh, variant covers. Now I'm like, how do we sneak into video games? Cause to me, like all this dude, I swear to you, like I, my, my, my wife, Gabby and I were big nerds, dude. Like we're just, and, and fans, like we're fans of everything. Like we're fans, you know? And, uh, and so I always think, OK, you know, it'd be fun if we got to do work on this property or if I got to work on this one or, you know, it'd be really fun. Uh, let's see if Sideshow wants to sell one of my prints so then we can go visit Sideshow. They have to let us in now and get to visit the campus. Or can we get the art style in a video game at some point? Like, can it work? And, and you know, we're big fans of games that, you know, are art forward. Like Ghost of Tsushima is, is beautiful, artistic game. But I also think about games like Limbo and Inside and uh, Cuphead and Cuphead, games. My, my boys love some Cuphead. Oh, they're so the kids are so good at it. I'm so terrible at it. Yeah, I was like, right? this is hard. It's hard. And they're brilliant. Right. And so but yeah, to me, it's a space just like like if I think of a kid right now, a kid is picking up a video game the way I picked up Spawn number one, waiting in line for hours outside my comic shop as a 10 year old. And I think about everything is connected. Maybe we introduce something to them, you know, in, in video games and then they see it in a comic book and then, in, and it's just fun to be able to experience things like that. And, and I cannot wait because I know it's going to happen. We're going to get this art style, this weird printmaking art style is going to be in a video game and it'll be the first time. So it'll be fun. Yeah. One thing that I wish my kids could experience that we experienced was something being sold out a video game being sold out on release day they, they don't have to deal with it now you can get it digitally or or i always say like back in the day when i was a kid living in germany um we didn't have vhs we had beta and, okay and on base there was like always we'd go to sunday brunch and then, then we'd go to the video rental store and they'd be like well we're the jedi is supposed to be returned today and we'd sit there and wait as long as we could tell parents like no go we gotta go that's, a, that's amazing so you so your your family you're an army family Yes, I'm an army brat. Oh, cool. And you were stationed in what your family was stationed in Germany? What part? Yeah, uh, Heidelberg. Oh, cool, man. And how long were you there? 84 to 88. Now I'm aging myself, but nice, dude. And so, yeah, that's, that's that is a good point. Like, I, I can't even imagine. It's already uh, strange to think to explain to kids what, you know, media consumption was like back then, but then take it to a different country. That's another another world altogether. Yeah. Yeah, you relied on video rental because you only had one AFN channel then as a oh. kid. I want to talk to you also about the print process and, and some of those influences because you mentioned that Ghost of Tsushima video, some of your influences. And then 
relaying from that into this wor- this like world you're building. Um, I don't want to mispronounce, but Takaro. Takaro. Yeah, Takaro. Takaro. See, I'll miss. <laughs> like, I always tell people, think of like, like Mexican sushi, taco roll. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> That's it. And talk. So Takaro is is yeah. So you know, essentially, what. So here's here's the thing, Brian. I'm always thinking that if I do something that is cool and different and new, if it's really good, then I should expect some people to start at least being inspired by, if not flat out imitating it. Right. And then if there's anything novel about what I'm doing, like, you know, bringing this art style into this world and I'm not the only one there's shout out, you know, Brian Reedy is an amazing artist who does printmaking in, in pop culture. Uh, um, Andrea Ordonez, who goes by Andeas on Instagram, and she helps print a lot of my prints. So there are others now, but the idea is like, how do I stand out if, if that becomes like a popular trend? Right. And so I immediately, I, I started thinking a few years back, you know, if I'm selling, if people really love my Kaiju stuff, I was doing like a lot of Godzilla stuff and King Kong, and I'm a huge fan of Ultraman and, you know, Pacific Rim and, I love all that stuff. I love Ultra Mega. Know, right. When they do, when they told me Ultra, I'm like, what? Let's go. You know? And so, um, yeah. So I said, eventually, like, let's say I'm the most popular Godzilla artist of all time one day. Right. Let's just say that that happens. Right. Whatever that means. How can how high can that ceiling really be as, a, as an artist, as a businessman? You know, it didn't feel like it was the smart long play. The smart long play was creating something that I had, you know, the reins on, you know, that I had control over that I could decide, you know, where it goes, what I do with it. And I can do whatever I want. I can make whatever I want. It's your IP, my IP. Exactly. And so, you know, um, it's so funny because it was at designer con 2019. Uh, one of my favorite shows designer con in, we, Oh, I set up my my booth and my prints, and I usually put my kaiju stuff right at the top. You know, Godzilla and King Kong. But this time, I made an original character. I had made an original character to pitch as a toy to some toy companies this at this show, right? And I was I had done them all digitally, and I sent them to my good friend, and I like to call him a mentor too because he's given me so much great advice and and uh, guidance. Uh, James Groman, toy designer, artist, you know, creator. And, um, you know, check out his work. It's amazing. James Groman. And um, and he goes, dude, it's awesome. The character's cool. But how are you going to show up to a convention as a guy who does printmaking and your creation is digital? It makes no sense. You've got to do it as a print. I'm like, you're right. So I made it and I, sn- and I displayed it right up against all the other kaiju. And when I got to meet Paul, uh, Sean Kirkham, Garima Sharmer from, uh, in, from uh, Skybound, they, I, I showed them Takaro. I go, well, and this is one of the guys I really want to develop. I have a world in mind for him. I want to flesh it out, you know, build something around it. They were like, dude, yeah, because that's, you know, Skybound's all about stories and building and creating. And, and I mean, they, like, look at Invincible. Look, I mean, uh, it, it's like it, it, they were all aboard on that idea. And so for me, Takaro is, the first kaiju of printmaking, the first giant monster of printmaking. And uh, what's the most fun about it, you know, you were talking about the YouTube show. We've been building his world and the story and characters through a series of prints. So much in the same way you would get a monthly issue of your favorite uh, comic and build out the world little by little, not, and of course the story and the plot. And then maybe at the end you would, get a a trade paperback or you'd want like the hardcover collected edition and there would be like supplemental material in there, like in behind the scenes and all this. We're working towards building out a story through prints that we are going to eventually launch as a, uh, I think would be a pretty badass Kickstarter campaign where we build out a whole book with all of this artwork, plus more artwork that I'm going to create for it. Pros working with a writer to like build it all out. And launch Takaro as a full-fledged IP with story and a universe and characters that hopefully people dig and go from that and, and just build. But it will have been built. This is what's different about it. 
in front of everybody live on YouTube once a week when we go, uh, or now we're doing them twice a month. We, we, I've designed characters with the live chat. You know, we have a video series called designing monsters live and on the channel. And we've designed one of his, his the monsters. He fights this giant, like insect looking uh, character named Shiga named by, by Colt in the chat. Uh, shout out Colt, Coltimus prime. And these were just uh, people coming to see the, uh, the, the, the live videos. And I would say, guys, I want to design a new character for Takaro to fight. What do you think we should do? We've, we have a turtle guy that he fights. We have this big Yeti type guy he fights, but we don't really have like a flying guy. What do you, and then so, yeah, let's do a flying guy. Let's give him this and that, and this type of fur and this type of arms and blah, blah, blah. And I worked it all out live on the iPad, sketched it all out. They gave me all their advice live in the chat. It was crazy. And then we, I made it as a carving and we just and debuted it on the next stream and, and people got to own it and have the artwork. So it's just really, dude, I'm telling you, there's no master plan in the sense that like I knew it all along, but it feels like something that's happening organically, partially because of the pandemic and not knowing how else to connect with people like I would at a convention but partially because this is what I would have always wanted, like as a fan, like if, you know, if Frank Miller had a video uh, stream on YouTube where once a week you could see what he was up to. I don't know if you don't want to, <laughs> I don't know if you don't want to watch that. It might, <laughs> might give you nightmares. Well, yeah, but I mean, if any of these, I, I mean, I love Frank, Miller, but like, yeah, anybody like look, Ryan Otley, you know, if you got to watch him put together, you know, his uh, design ideas for Invincible or for Amazing Spider-Man or whatever. And then you in the chat, you know, you got to chime in. I know Daniel Warren Johnson does uh, Friday with D-dubs on YouTube where you get to like um, inter interact with him a little bit and stuff. I think that's an easy way for an artist to, um, I don't want to say give back because I'm taking from them too, but an easy way for an artist to build community around the artwork. Take like a peek behind the curtain also. Yeah. And like, and really saying like, dude, Takaro, we're building this together, dude. Like if let's say knock on wood, Takaro pops off. Like we release like the prints sell out every time. So that's a good sign. Um, if we release a book, right. And the book launches the universe and it's available, you know, in mass and, and people can get it anywhere, find it at a store or whatever it is. And it pops off. And then we say, Oh, maybe we should do something else with the book. Maybe we should turn it into you know, um, a, a sequel to the book. And then maybe It'll now we the have next Ninja Turtles. I mean, you know, so like, let's say it does. Like, let's say it, it pops off. You could now think of, dude, this is what I think about because I came from a music background. You could now think of being, I was, dude, I remember when Takaro was like this indie thing on YouTube. And like, I was there when he created Shiga, the Death Moth. And uh, in fact, I named him Shiga, the Death Moth. And it's like, when you talk about your favorite band that you saw at a club before, yeah, before they, they go mainstream. <laughs> right. And so yeah. like, I'm like, why not apply that? Because as a kid, I used to love that. Like I found something, there's only a, few, a small group of people that know about it, but it's getting bigger and it's building up and it's rad and I love it. And I, you know, and so I want to create that. And I don't know. I think we're doing a really good job. People keep coming back and things keep popping off. So I think we're doing well, but that's the goal that, that no matter what, there's always this engagement with the people who are help supporting it. Yeah. And Takaro is going to be the mascot of that. I think. Yeah. I think it's great. Especially I like the Kickstarter idea. I think is yeah. really awesome. Cause I was going to ask is like those prints sound like they would make a great, I was even more simple, simple, simple man minded. Tell me, tell <laughs> me. I was like, Hey, you know, um, you know, bring those prints in to just a coffee table type book 100%. for people to look at. But I liked what you're saying where, you know, you, you have added commentary in there. You have different backgrounds, different stories that just kind of takes that idea and expands on it makes it so much better. And I hope that when you do put it on Kickstarter, that you will come back on to Simple Man's Comics so we can tell the you Simple know. Man's Comics community about when it's going on Kickstarter. I'm your new co-host. They didn't tell you that <laughs> yeah. I'm here every week. Dude. Heck yeah. No, <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, no, you, you know, to, to expand on what you're saying. Yeah. The original idea was people always ask, can you collect all this artwork to a book? You know, stuff has sold out stuff. I can't get anymore, or I don't have space on my walls for everything, but I want to appreciate it. And my idea was like, let's do that, but let's also make it. So there, there is narrative going throughout, you know? So that's the idea. 
So I also want to step back just a little bit when you're yeah. talking about video games again, which, you know, makes me think of video games, which makes me think of microtransactions, which also leads into something that's even bigger now outside of video games. And that, of course, is non-fungible tokens or NFTs. <laughs> yeah, man, the big thing. Yes. As, do you have anything in mind for possibly, is there going to be some Attack Peter NFTs coming down the road or... We're, we're definitely exploring those things. You know, um, the thing, I, first of all, I'm open to all of it. You know, I, I want to be wherever the people want to be. So like if, you know, my, my first idea with, you know, all my artwork is like, I want to go hang out at a convention. What do people who go to cons want? Let's make something in that realm. Right. And um, but if it because if it, if it is the thing that NFT is where you've got to be, then yeah, why not? We'll do NFTs. I don't I don't. It's not something that I think about in the sense that like if I make a design, it might be awesome on a print. It might be awesome on a shirt. It could be a cool sticker. It could be like a wallpaper, it could be NFT. It could be like something digitally exclusive. And the amazing thing about getting to be a part of the Skybound team is that there's always, you know, some folks working on, um, you know, what that next big thing is going to be. And so, um, there are certain things that I'll be like, guys, I really want to do blank. Like, can we do this? And they're like, let's make it happen. And then sometimes they'll be like, hey, we got some really interesting ideas for NFT, for example. And like, what do you think? And I'm like, let's go. Like, let's do it. Like, why not? And so it's not, I, I won't, I don't want to tell you it's something that's like in the immediate uh, horizon, but it is something that that we're looking into. And because uh, that's, that's the thing with, with what we do is, I'm an artist and I'm making artwork, but there's an amazing team of people like working on attack Peter as a brand, you know? And uh, so it's a team effort and, and there are a lot of people working on stuff like that. It's not immediate though. Uh, I, I just, I, I sooner want to put out a Takaro action figure. That's what I want to do next. I, now, not- I noticed you mentioned Mike Mignola, Mike yeah. Mignola and just like with, when talking about your artwork, that's another artist where as soon as you see the art, it stands yeah. out. Right. Do you have any other influences that you? I noticed in some of your videos, like your your big classic samurai cinema fan. Oh yeah, and that definitely comes out in your artwork. But is there any other influences, experiences that you can kind of that goes into your artwork when you're doing this? Hundred percent, dude. You know, um, one of the other biggest influences. Well, you know, one of my favorite artists that I I I. In my early 20s, again, I, I came across their work and I dissected it forever and is uh, Eric Powell, creator of The Goon and Hillbilly. And now uh, you just had on your channel. Yeah, exactly. Which I was going to say, it's so crazy that I get to have people like that on. But um, but there was one artist that I met early on. I discovered their work early on or I came across it. And um, I feel like he's one of the best out there, period, full stop. And at the same time, criminally underrated in terms of like his mainstream awareness. Like he makes tons of stuff, but um, is I'm talking about Scott Morris. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, Scott Morris to me is he's okay. So he's a comic book artist. I discovered um, I, I came across his work um, reading uh, Sam and Twitch. Uh, so if you remember that, that spawn offshoot and he had like a very like um, impressionistic style, like a lot of movement energy um, and um and then I met him at Comic-Con one year, almost 20 years ago. And he was doing these paintings on the spot, like commissions for people that you would just, he had a stack of like pre background, like watercolor backgrounds on these like illustration boards. And you would come up to him, tell him what you want as a commission. And he would, without sketching anything, just maybe like a, a small reference. Cause this is before iPhone, you know, he had to think about it sometimes. And uh, he would say, okay, and he, right on the spot, boom, 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 like a modern version of Sumie painting, um, speaking of Japanese art. And he would do these dynamic, bombastic, incredible uh, paintings on the spot right while you watched. And uh, that influenced me so much because I said, there's a, an added factor to this. It's not, I already love the artwork. I, uh, he had a comic called Magic Pickle that I read when I was on Oni Press that I loved. Um, but when I saw his work and his work creation in person, and that there was a performative aspect to it, 
I always felt like that. I have to figure that out. And it's partially why I sketch the way I sketch because I want to like, boom, 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 boom. Like, I like how that feels like it, it feels fun. It looks like it feels fun. So I always started drawing like that. Boom, 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 boom. And so now carving is not as fast as that, but there is a performative aspect to it. And uh, like you said, you know, um, before when I do like Skybound Expo or when I do my YouTube streams, I like to emphasize that. Like, how do I print or how does the carving? That's why we have videos on it. Because I was so inspired by the fact that somebody who could do that on the spot, they have to be at such a high level here, like understanding what they're doing. The execution has to be on point. Um, the confidence, it's, there's a little bit of swagger to it that I loved. And, um, and so, yeah, he really made a huge mark on me. Not that he knew, I was just watching Years later in 2019, uh, Comic Con, I, I got the chance to exhibit there, and I and it was the first time I had been back in like 15 years, and all my career had started off in that gap of time. And so the first thing I did was walk up to his booth and I go, "Dude, I've been wanting to come back and tell you this forever, man." But like uh, so much about the success that I've been able to have has come from being inspired by watching you work, um, digesting your artwork the performative, you know, all that. And, uh, and I was so happy to be able to do it, you know, and he's just one of the nicest guys out there. So it was excellent. So yeah, Scott Morse, please check him out at crazy Morse on Instagram. Insane stuff. Yeah. We'll put, we'll put it up on the screen right yeah. now. So you guys can make sure you follow him. I want to also talk about, we've talked about some of these great projects you've done, especially some of this collaboration with skybound, make sure you guys go to skybound.com. I'll put the link in there as well. Put it up on the screen right now. Check out everything available from Attack Peter. I mean, there's there's a, there's swag, there's prints. You know, one thing I wanted to ask you is, do you have a preference on whether you do color prints or mostly black print or, you know, which do you kind of like playing in both areas or do you have a, a, a favorite of style that you like to do, stick to? Well, um, I love color and I barely use it in my artwork because um, the, the original design idea for these prints is, um, if you came back year after year and bought a new piece of work of mine, they would fit well in a series together because they're all black and white or, or at least some level of monochromatic. And I also used to think to be quite honest that if you were perhaps, you know, in a relationship with someone who maybe wasn't as excited about putting up you know, your favorite character in 18 by 24 size on their wall, that at least you could persuade them if you did, weren't, if you weren't blessed with the opportunity to have a man cave of your own, or, uh, you know, so at least you could persuade them if it was black and white, because it kind of fits in nicely and easily. So that was the original mentality behind it. But the truth is, I love using color. And that's why when we got a chance, speaking of the Skybound store, to uh, create the first Attack Peter vinyl figure, the uh, Daruma um, that you can, uh, that's there on the store. I said, okay, let's not do what everybody's going to expect us to do and do a black and white figure. Let's do it in color, full color. Yeah, it's and vibrant. It's, it's, yes. It's awesome. Yeah, because, you know, I, I, I don't want to be, you know, corn, uh, put into a corner when it comes to a, a certain design aspect. We've done, speaking of screen prints before, we've done some screen prints that have beautiful colorations to them. And uh, thanks to, you know, the work of uh, Mike Aronson and Eric Denman over at Skybound. They love, I love the work they do helping to bring some of those images to life. Uh, but yeah, like the Daruma figure was something where I said, this is a great place to explore color a little bit more when we do 3D and do figures because, you know, um, it's, it, it's, it's got a pop, you know, and the Daruma itself is uh, a colorful um I iconic image and so we got a chance to explore with that when we uh, designed the Daruma. so yeah there's both facets and i love it all there's there's really no uh best for me i also want to talk about and we again we talked about wanting to work in video games but yeah. beyond that what would be the dream attack peter job or the dream campaign would you want your own ip like you talked about with Taco. Yeah, remember that. Mexican sushi taco roll. Taco <laughs> yeah, taco roll. roll. <laughs> but, or, you know, were you saying, hey, say for instance, Tokyo Olympics is coming up and yeah. at the end of the month, a huge campaign with that. I mean, what what drives you, or where do would you like to kind of 
see yourself i, I will not be cl- you know cliche and say where do you see no, yourself for you. five years but yeah no i get it um dude to be honest with you i i used to imagine what other artists and creators would think like that and the funny thing is i'm thinking the exact same way i've always thought which is man it's it's literally this simple i, go, I i'm sitting on the couch after working all day and with my wife gabby and we're playing a video game or we're watching a show or you know and i'm like man i just want to like we're watching mandalorian right love mandalorian and we're like and i'll just say out loud man i just want to visit the set of mandalorian or just i just want to like visit the workshop where they make the props just one day like i won't touch anything i'll be fast i just want to see it and then i kind of reverse engineer a project that could get me closer to that right and so I think in those terms, like I want to be able to look back at, at, at the end and say, I got to do whatever I want. You know, one of my biggest inspirations more so even than for his artwork, but in his mentality, his mindset is Todd McFarlane. And um, I remember when, like I told you earlier, like I stood in line to buy spawn number one, I freaked out when I saw you know, the Spider-Man comic line that he got to do, the, just a plain Spider-Man line. And uh, that stuff blew my mind as a kid. And so I always knew McFarlane, 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 the name, the, the guy, the creator. And then I remember when Spawn became a TV show on, on HBO. And I'm like, what? And it's like an adult animated show. It's amazing. Okay. And then I remember when McF- uh, Spawn became a movie. I'm like, what? And then I remember when Spawn was a video game on the original PlayStation. And when I got to buy the Spawn toys at KB Toy Store, and I'm like, there probably was an army of people telling him, what are you, you can't just, you can't, you know, you can't do that. I mean, that's what image was founded on. Yep. Right. And I'm electrified by thinking of that mindset that somebody could say, I just want to do this and why not? So yeah, to be honest with you, Brian, like I want to do, I want to do that. I want to take Takaro. I want Takaro to be, um, book art book slash comic thing that really doesn't exist prior and establish a story. I want people to fall in love with these characters. I want to do, I want to, you know, bother Ian Howe and Dan Murray at skybound video games and say, Hey guys, can we do a video game somehow? Like, I don't know how this stuff works. And it's probably obnoxious for me to even ask it, but can we do a video? (laughs) And then, or uh, I want to go and pitch it to, you know, uh, get a toy line made. I want to go and get a show just, and it's not because I have this mind, this mentality of, I'm going to be the biggest thing there is, but I just feel like this life is a gift and this opportunity is hella rare. And if it's rare to be a to have success as an artist, it's 1 million times more rare to have a, a, a group of people with proven success, like skybound believing in you and pushing you. And so to me, it's like, I want to kick ass in every freaking aspect of this industry that I can so yeah, dude, so that we can have a talk row virtual reality experience where like we're hanging out with him and he's huge and like, you know, or we go to the movies and watch talk you know, movie and, and why the heck not? And then yeah, you know, people buy- like me trying to buy tickets. Can no, I get two tickets whole- for Tucker? Tuck- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay, you gotta pronounce it first, sir. You have to put it on the post movie poster. You just Tuck hand them a label. Old. Yeah, exactly. Phonetically. Yeah. But no, and then the idea would be like, you know, what would be the one different thing that I could do that hasn't been done yet? to like document the whole journey from start to finish. Like that is what I'm doing. If this whole thing falls apart in a year and DA at Skybound like says, I'm tired of this guy's name being on our brand, get rid of this guy. You know, not that he would, he's the nicest guy, but let's just say he woke up, you know, Robert Kirkman's like, who the hell is this nerd? Get him out of here. Uh, Let's just say, right. Then at least there's like this amazing catalog or or documentation of what we did so far. But if it works and if it keeps going in the direction it's going now, dude, it'd be so cool to look back and even this conversation and like, and then, and, and us talking about this and, and being able to give this to someone to say, Hey, look at how this guy struggled and what he did to get there. So there's like a little bit of a blueprint, you know, Uh, I wish there was a blueprint for me when I was coming up and trying to figure this out. There's not always one. And you spend time talking to people and trying to glean little bits of advice and information from people who don't necessarily have anything to do with what you're doing, but you're trying to find a connection there, you know, and, and sometimes people are generous with it. Sometimes people aren't, 
So I, I, I yes, dude, I want to do it all, but I also want to leave a trail of breadcrumbs for the next person coming up. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it goes back to like the the one constant that we've talked about kind of throughout this whole video is even when asking, hey, where do you want to be? It's still about, hey, let's not worry about the finish line. Enjoy the journey of getting there, yes, which makes dude. it so much more enjoyable. Because you know, it's the case. Like, you know, like, I mean, I, I equate it honestly to like, let's say you're, you're, you know, we're all, you know, big comic Comic-Con fans. Let's say, you know, you're going to a Comic-Con, whether it's local or you're going to San Diego, whatever it is. Getting there is awesome and being there is awesome. But part of the fun is the anticipation, and getting planning. in the car, planning it, getting in the car, getting on a plane, coordinating with your friends, people who maybe live near you or you only see once a year at a convention, planning what you're going to do after the show. All that stuff is so fun. And when you remember it, you don't just remember your time on the floor. You remember all that. And in, especially after a year like we just had, dude, how many times did you sit and enjoy memories and think and say to yourself the next time i get to do this i'm gonna like savor the heck out of it you know what i mean and so that's that's what this is for me it's like dude i geek out on my job is so the geek out level is so hardcore almost like though on a bad day let's say we're waiting for an email to come back from a certain c- company. But when you get, and, but then you think about, holy crap, we're emailing so-and-so from this company. That's crazy. You know what I mean? So there's yeah. no bad days. It's, it's yeah. awesome, man. And, and then also like you say, Comic-Con, another thing is almost like when, when you're hunting that, that grail comic book, like it, I, for like four years, um, hunted down the 1986, the Marvel star mass of the universe. I oh, wanted no all issues one through 13 and a nine, eight. So over five years, I did that. <laughs> Once you're done, you're like, okay, now what? <laughs> yeah, there's like a hangover almost, right? Like, like the hunt is the thing, dude. You know what I mean? I, I, I believe that totally. Like the hunt, the the path to it, you know. And 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 like you're saying, like you can celebrate and enjoy and savor like little benchmarks along the way. So like if you're collecting 13 issues, like maybe when you got the first, second, third, those are like little triumphs. But the truth, yeah, I started is- keeping. Uh, a note in my iPhone and had like a checklist. And I was like, man, I just need to find issue number 12. And then, you know, it's a whole thing. And it gives you like an opportunity, like, and now searching for issue 12, like maybe that puts you on a path to go to a comic book store out of your area. And then when you're there, you find a new place to eat. That's really good. Or like, you know, like there's a whole thing, like it's just a drive and it's just an excuse to save her life on a real deep level. Like any kind of quest and hunt like that. I'm just lucky that, you know, we get to do it. In, in this way that's kind of odd, you know, printmaking giant monsters and and doing it on YouTube. It's a weird descriptor, but it's the path. It's the tool set that I have. And it's allowed me crazy, crazy, crazy opportunities that I'm so grateful for. But yeah, man. Hunt. So there's one other thing I wanted to talk about. I mean, we know you're a video game fan. We know you're a comic book fan. So being a comic book channel, can you tell myself in the community what are some of your favorite comic books? Do you have a favorite book in your collection? Do you have a favorite creator team? You know, yes. what kind of drives your comic book collection, so to say? Okay, so first thing I'm going to say is that this, this hurts to say. I I I was I used to work at a comic book shop for a couple of years in the early 2000s, a store called Outland Comics in Miami, Florida. They had a few locations. It was awesome, and it was there that I discovered Invincible. Believe it or not, it was on a super slow day. And I forget the issue number, but I could probably, we could probably pull it up. It was the one where um, I believe the Flaxen alien race is introduced. And so whatever issue number that was, was the one that was on the rack. I picked it up and I'm like, what is this? And I was like, definitely reading a ton of Marvel DC, a lot of dark horse, you know, but when I picked up that book and and I know it sounds like I'm being a skybound show, but it's freaking true. I'm like, this is the freaking best superhero book. And I, so I started reading that exclusively. And, um, but I always collected Mignola artwork. I I had a checklist from comics buyer got comic buyer guide, comics buyers guide. I think where it was like, it came out right before the movie, the first help the Hellboy movie came out and it had like all of Mignola's bibliography up to that point with a checkbox next to every issue. And so I would go to hunting every Mignola issue of everything it's like i got into alpha flight that way and 
Um, you got, I got to see his stuff on Rocket Raccoon before anybody cared about Guardians and his Dracula, Bram Stoker stuff. I mean, he has such an incredible like run. Uh, he had an amazing issue of Doctor Doom, Doctor Strange. That, and uh, yeah, collecting his work was amazing. Um, I, I love stuff like like Sin City, Frank Miller, The Goon was huge for me. And then I liked collecting all, all, all the image indie stuff, man. Uh, so a, a lot of the indie stuff was big for me. We Three by Grant Morrison was my favorite books of all time. Did you ever read that? I haven't read that. I'm, oh, a, bit, it's, then it's, I'm, I'm a Grant Morrison fan, of course, but. It's a weird one. It's a, uh, it's, I don't know if you know anything about it, but it's basically a, a, a dog, cat and a rabbit are all like lab animals. And they are like being experimented on with robo technology that makes them able to communicate with like terrible English, but they like rebel and they escape. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like that movie where incredible like, journey with, with a twist. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I was gonna, I would never have remembered the words, but yeah, incredible journey with like a really dark twist, but yeah, man, I just, I loved, I had, I had this whole collection of amazing comics and I sold them early, the whole collection in Kevin Smith. It, it was right around. Yeah, I did because I, I was, you know, running out of money for art supplies and I had to keep up and make new stuff and, and everything I was making back then. None of it is what I show now. I was doing a lot of paintings and stuff like that. So, and sculpture, but I had to like, and, and dude, I had, I had, a. Uh, I had the second appearance of the lizard ever. It was definitely not like a nine. It was probably like a 5.6, but it was autographed by Stan Lee. I met him in person and it was like a ballpoint pen signature. I, the, the, the one of the coolest comics I, I owned that I was proud of was the first appearance of the hobgoblin. I think that's amazing. Spider-Man 160 something, but, or 60 something. I, no, one, it, it was the one with a tattoo inside. Which oh is yeah. The, right. So and it's uh, funny. Cause and what makes it even more say, make it more better <laughs> but it's and it's talking to you it's a lot like me my nostalgia drives yeah. my collection so it's, it's oh, dude, those yeah. books back then it's not just the, the book itself but it's the sentimental oh dude it's the journey as we can yeah, i never collected for thinking that i was going to hit it on some issue although i did get lucky because of my tastes were a little you know off and so one of the Mignola issues I hunted forever was the not official first appearance of Hellboy, but kind of was the first appearance of Hellboy. Next Men 21. That was um uh color who, version, right? Yeah, but who created who created a uh, next men? Um just tip my tongue. It even dude. made it, it that issue you made it into an episode of Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Oh, really? Did it really? Yeah, they're talking like, about it in Big Bang Theory. Okay, so next men 21, dude. And if you can imagine, this is right before uh oh john Byrne, look at them idiot and so um yeah and so uh right before the the movie came out hellboy comics nobody had them nobody cared about them in i mean in, in terms of like mass market appeal so to find them there weren't the trades were hard to find and so i i went into my local comic book shop 25 cent bin now get this i found five mint copies of next men 21 back to back to back to back to back in the 25 cent bin and back then you know i sold uh i gave i kept one gave one to a buddy of mine who was the only other hellboy fan i knew and i sold the other three for 100 bucks a piece on ebay back then which for me was huge money back then. yeah and uh but yeah that's man the that's the most like i ever think i i made off comics but i just i just love the medium dude you know i mean i'm just I don't have to tell you there's something about it that is the quickest and easiest way to experiment with new ideas and try strange things out. And it's great because I mean, it, it evolves, you know, I mean, I still, I, I still hold on to nostalgia, but I love the way you know, the comic hobby is and how it all intertwines now between comics and pop culture and even sports you can put into that. Yeah. It's just kind of, um, I always say it and I, my other friends and other friends that are YouTubers say it is it's kind of like a way of buying back your childhood. Like totally. back in the day when I didn't have allowance money to buy stuff costs a lot more now, but I'm able to yeah. pick up some of those books. Yeah. And it's all relative. You know, it's, it's like, there is something there and, and that, and you can't be explained. Look, it's a luxury item at the end of the day. And especially when you're collecting back issues, that's for sure. But there is something to be said about that intrinsic value. And maybe it is, 
just what you're saying. Like, we never thought we would have this issue of this book and you're holding it, you know, like even sometimes I go to a convention and I see a CGC copy of an, of an issue. I've only, you know, never seen in person. I just get to see it up close. I don't know why it's magical, but it's magical. It's like a, cause I remember being super short little kid going to the store and seeing them on the top shelf and not being able to even touch them, you know? Um, it's, it's, and it's also super intimate. Like when you experience a comic, it's you, it's right there. Now, do you read comics on the iPad? I have, I, I've read them on some on the iPad, some on MacBook, but I still like, but yeah, paper copy. And even, um, I'm a big trade paperback or omnibus guy for sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, that's what I want to get into. Cause I, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to get all the back. Pictures, but I have this, I collect like anything Jack Kirby collected edition of this. Anyway. I'm, I'm hoping when they bring the fantastic four back into the MCU, I really want like a big oversized edition of some of the original fantastic four comics. I know the artist editions are out there. I love them. I have a Hellboy one, the IDW ones, but I really want like the original Marvel pages, like colored and the whole thing, but like big, I want, cause now I have the room for the big one. I want the big one. <laughs> So just to recap so far, we've talked about your print process. We've talked about the, the big project you're involved with, this, the collaboration with Skybound. We talked about how I wanted to get into video games. We talked about where you kind of see yourself going. But we also have some stuff right on the horizon coming up. You've done, like I got behind me, that Fantastic Ultra Mega cover. We also have Skybound Expo coming up. And within Skybound Expo, they have some great variants. Can you provide... Any information, tease? Do you have another cover coming up maybe for Skybound? Well, um, the amazing thing at Skybound Expo, it, one of the amazing things is the, the whole event is crazy. It's, uh, it's so much fun. But uh, our buddy Sean Kirkham, a.k.a. Big Clutch, runs Comics Fault Live. And, man, he is able to get some crazy things to happen. And what I can tell you is that absolutely we are going to have a brand new cover variant dropping that day. And so, yeah, we're going to drop a variant cover to Invincible number 19, the first appearance of Battle Beast. And uh, there is a big honking chunk of Battle Beast block print magic on the cover of that issue. And I think if you liked, if you like the Ultra Mega, this one's going to blow you away because I, I want to say uh, our guy... <laughs> One of the designers in, uh, and, and logo creators at Skybound, Andres Juarez, put together an amazing uh, composition for the cover of that book. And, and I think you guys are going to flip for it. It's fantastic. Yeah, and I also want to say, mention in Comics Vault Live, you want to make sure you tune in to the Comics Vault Live because yeah. whenever they put stuff up there, it's not a, a large quantity of books. No. I mean, we would, one time Ultra Mega, I think was 175 copies. Yep. Not sure what this will be, but you bet it's probably in the ballpark. And not only are you going to have a variant, but you're also going to have a print like you did for Ultra Mega as well. Yeah, right? yeah. And this one's going to be twice as big. So the the, the Battle Beast print is a uh, 20 by 30 sheet of uh, Nepalese Lakta paper. So it's like imported from Nepal where we get our paper. And uh, yeah, Battle Beast is huge, 18 by 24 um, on it. And uh, you'll have like a big, his, his name uh, splattered across in Japanese and there's some ultra violence on it too. Yeah, so that's coming up on Skybound Expo, which is July 17th, 18th, right? That, yeah, that and much, much more. We are, because, you know, because then I got my own uh, segment and we're going to be, unveiling some crazy stuff there too but yeah don't miss it man because I, I got one of the hardest things for me um to do is tell people sorry i don't have any you know the day after minutes after uh, you know hours after yeah, minutes is minutes is the right thing to say yeah, they, yeah, they go quick yeah. yeah and 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 i and i unfortunately like they are they're limited and that's part of the what makes them valuable but uh i, th I think people weren't sure what to expect the first go around and they sold out super quick we sold out the first edition of the ultra mega print. Then we sold out a second a blue variant of the ultra mega print and they're gone. They're, they're gone, gone. And it's a particular thing. Like I think people collecting these really want them, yeah. you know, if you're making an effort to be at CVL and you're into ultra mega and you want the cover and you want the print, it's, I'm sure some people are going to flip them, but I'm thinking the majority of the people who are, or getting these are collecting them and holding them. And, and so I think it's going to be hard to get them after the fact so yeah it's a freaking honor because to me one of the greatest artists in comic books today period is ryan otley and a character like battle beast getting to work on him and 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 slapping him on the cover there 
And then opening the front cover and you see, you know, Robert Kirkman, Corey Walker, Ryan Otley, Russ Wooten, Attack Peter, you know, Andres Juarez. It's crazy, dude. It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's a surreal feeling. So yeah, it's a special one. Yeah. And just to give you guys a little hint, make sure you're, you follow attack Peter, make sure you're following big clutch on Instagram, make sure you're following skybound. That way you can know they'll be posting links. You, Cause there's a um, comics vault live Instagram, Twitter account. Make sure you're following those on social. And then another thing is when you, once comics vault live and when it, attack Peter's doing his segment, make sure you're like logged in. If you can be, make sure you're on, on your computer versus your phone. Make sure you kind of already logged into your PayPal because all those things will speed it up when you're getting into the checkout and trying to pay for things because you don't want to have stuff in your cart trying to scramble to get all that going. And next thing you know, you get, you get your cart is emptied out because yeah. they've sold out. It's crazy, man. Cause you know, the, we keep getting a wider, wider audience and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's already been a few months since the last time we did ultra mega and, and uh, audience has grown but the addition sizes aren't going to grow so it's going to be a little more challenging as we go but i think it's worth the effort man the stuff's going to be yeah so don't miss out (laughs) and again like we mentioned before make sure you follow attack peter on you check out his youtube channel follow him on instagram follow him on all his social i'll put links in the description of this video make sure you check those out but peter i thank you so so much for coming on before we go you get the last word. What do you want the viewers to know? Well, thanks so much, Brian. It's a real honor to be here and get to talk to your audience and all the folks that love this uh, and have the passion for collecting, you know, in this world so much like I do. Um, yeah, I- I'm just happy and honored to be able to to basically walk among you, create some artwork in this world. And uh, I think if you guys are a fan of the artwork, the art style. We're doing so, so much over on YouTube at Attack Peter on YouTube. We create new artwork there. I take lots of suggestions from the live chat. We release our artwork first on the YouTube channels. We drop the links in the chat so they don't go live until we drop them. So it's like, you know, pretty fair way to get stuff. Um, and we're posting all the time on, uh, we, we go live on Thursdays at 7 30 PM Eastern time, 4 30 Pacific. We are I'm always on Instagram and, uh, do stuff on Twitter and Facebook attack Peter, but we also have a, a Facebook group. That's been a real help for collectors who may be like just getting into my work or are just now starting to collect it and want to find some stuff that's been sold out. Um, attack Peter print crew on Facebook it was a fan started group. And there's a lot of awesome people there that buy, sell, trade stuff. They don't take advantage of each other. They're not scalping each other. And if you live in like a weird time zone or if you can't make it to a live stream and you know we're dropping something you want to get, um, you can get a poster buddy there. People like link up with each other and somebody will pick it up for you and send it to you. So lots of awesome spirit there. So I, I strongly encourage people to check it out. But yeah, I think that that's pretty much it. But thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, I mean, I'm one... First of all, open invitation. Anytime you want to come on the show, you're always welcome here. And awesome. again, make sure you guys check out Attack Peter. Check out his YouTube channel. Make sure you check out his website. He's got a bunch of stuff up there. And of course, Skybound's website. They have that collab section, a bunch of stuff where you can also pre-order that vinyl figure that he was talking about. So check those out. And again, thank you so much for coming on. Anytime, like I said before, you're always welcome. With that being said, guys, this is Brown Submits Comics. See you guys in the next video.